received his MD degree from Yale University, completed his residency at Mount Sinai and fellowship at the Corinne Goldsmith Dickinson Center for Multiple Sclerosis. As a clinician educator, he served as Neurology Residency Program Director for 10 years through 2019, and Dr. Krieger maintains clinical practice at the CGD Center for MS, where he received two Coleman Awards for Excellence in Physician-Patient Communication. He's participated in numerous MS clinical trials and lectures nationally about MS with an emphasis on emerging therapies and the MS disease course. Dr. Krieger proposed the topographical model of MS, which is a reconceptualization of multiple sclerosis clinical course that was published as the cover of neurology, neuroimmunology, and neuroinflammation, and was the subject of an article in the Scientific American. His first narrative medicine piece, A Neurologist in the COVID Unit, Reflections on Redeployment, was published in Neurology in 2020. Thank you for joining us today, Dr. Krieger. Dr. Levin, thank you so much. And thank you again to you and Dr. Thomas uh, for the invitation. Um, I've been at Mount Sinai for 17 or so years, and this is my first uh, opportunity to address the Department of Internal Medicine, and I'm, I'm grateful for that. Um, and uh, I know many of you and share patience with you and have admired many of you for many years, uh, including you, Dr. Levin, from back in your formative years uh, here as a medical student. Um, so congratulations on your success. Um, and, you know, I put together this talk on multiple sclerosis for you with a real attempt to be not esoteric and not go deep into the weeds of my own field, but rather try to do something that would have some relevance and resonance to as many of you as I could. So if the talk is a little bit basic, that's, that's okay. I, I just didn't want to get too far from things that are clinically meaningful in, in all of our practices. Um, I'll try to get through it briskly so that there's time for questions. And if any of you want to push me on science of interest for you, I'm happy to talk about that. So let me share my slides with you. Okay. And uh, Emily, can we see the slides full screen? Beautiful. Okay. So um, multiple sclerosis, uh, sort of an overview of the disease and our approach to it for the year. Uh, here are my disclosures. I do work as a consultant with some of the companies in the MS world, mostly on creating educational content. Um, obviously at Mount Sinai, we don't do promotional talks for products and there'll be nothing promotional in this uh, grand round, certainly. Here are the objectives, the way I laid them out for us, uh, to talk about the clinical course of MS and its protean manifestations so that you can really help to recognize the disease and distinguish it from others that might mimic multiple sclerosis. Recognize some of the characteristic MRI findings MRI is hugely important for us in MS and to try to distinguish MRI findings that connote MS from other uh, uh, non-specific MRI findings. So I'll spend a little time on that. And then I wanna show you the goals of treatment in MS, noting that I realize you're not gonna be making a lot of the disease modifying therapy decisions in MS yourselves, but I wanted to give you kind of a window into how neurologists think about it in the modern era. And then you know, no grand rounds nowadays would be complete without touching on COVID. So a little bit about the intersection of MS and COVID-19. So to begin at the beginning, and, I, and I'm a clinician, so I like to start with the clinical picture and then go to the science after that, rather than starting with molecules. So the clinical picture in MS is this is an inflammatory and autoimmune disease, specifically and solely of the central nervous system. It does not inflame other uh, body tissues, other organs, or other aspects of the nervous system like peripheral nerves. It is a strictly central nervous system disease, and it typically is characterized by relapses of neurological symptoms, and then the progression of impairment of function, and we'll talk a little more about what that means. One of the challenges with MS is that it is incredibly variable, and the signs and symptoms, particularly early, can include vision loss, brainstem signs, weakness, sensory dysfunction, imbalance. No two people with MS look quite the same. It's one of the real challenges in this disease state, unlike other neurologic diseases, like for instance, Parkinson's disease, which takes a very particular phenotype, or ALS takes a very particular phenotype. Multiple sclerosis is multiple at its very heart, and it is incredibly diverse, which makes it a challenge. But also when medical students or residents sort of say to me, well, why did you spend your whole career on one disease? It doesn't feel like that being an MS specialist. It doesn't feel like we do the same thing every day. 
certainly not with every patient, because there really is an enormous range of disease characteristics and severity. Some of the common early features include these attacks of weakness, numbness, double vision, uh, impaired vision. Um, the diagnosis is often very uncertain at the beginning. So you'll of course hear patients say they have possible MS or no one could tell them if they really have MS. They have a long diagnostic journey to being told that they have MS. But later, once the disease recurs and disseminates in the brain and spinal cord, it, it typically becomes more clear or more obvious. But of course, the goal is for us to prevent all of that. And MRI is, a, as I said, a hugely important window to show us lesions in MS that we might not otherwise have been able to detect. And MRI has become built into our diagnostic criteria, as I'll show you. So to help distinguish MS from not MS, here's a couple of clinical hallmarks, sort of clinical pearls. When we talk about an MS relapse or an attack, um, these symptoms typically emerge over days and last for days to weeks. They behave the way inflammation behaves, sort of evolving and then gradually receding. MS relapses or attacks are not typically brief and transient and fleeting. They're not electrical phenomena. They are inflammatory phenomena. And so they are often slower. Typically, MS relapses and lesions are referable to the optic nerve, which is optic neuritis, brainstem dysfunction like double vision and vertigo, cerebellar dysfunction like ataxia and imbalance, and spinal cord symptoms like a hemisensory loss or weakness in both legs, a paraparesis. But the most important point here um, in diagnosis MS and distinguishing MS from other things is the findings are typically localizable to central nervous system damage. Now, I know that's a very neurologist thing to say, that we care so much about localization, but the point here is that these symptoms are not typically nebulous. They are not just fatigue or a feeling of cognitive fog or vague dizziness or diffuse pain. They are focal lesions causing symptoms that we can have discrete findings um, to elucidate. I will talk about fatigue towards the end of the talk, but it's not part of our diagnostic criteria. Now, to go old school for a second, um, I feel like giving grand rounds in medicine, I feel like we really want to incorporate the history of our field. So let's uh, bring in one, one character uh, who has a role in both the history of internal medicine and neurology, which is Charcot. So Charcot described multiple sclerosis as in a triad. You know, Charcot loved getting his name on things. So Charcot's triad here was intention tremor, nystagmus, and scanning speech. So a tremor of the limb, tremor of the eyes, and in essence, tremor of speech. And all of this points to the white matter pathways going in and out of the cerebellum. He really described a cerebellar disorder. And you could think about all those pathways as being vulnerable to a demyelinating disease like MS. But I would say in the modern era, um, that description would be someone with end stage progressive MS. And so thankfully nowadays, that does not describe MS very well anymore. It describes what we are endeavoring to prevent and do a pretty good job in the modern era at preventing. All right, so let's zoom out and talk about epidemiology. Who gets MS? I think you all know this. It is typically uh, young adults age 20 to 40, but a huge range from pediatric cases, and we have a pediatric MS specialist on staff, to geriatric MS, and people can be diagnosed with MS well into their 60s and 70s. Um, so big range, but focused on young adults. Women outnumber men with this disease by two to three to one, probably closer to three to one now. The number of people in the US to get a sense of prevalence, it's 1 million. That's the report from about two years ago. 1 million people in the US with this disease. It is the most common cause of acquired disability in young adults. So I, I would tell students or others, you know, if you see somebody in their 20s, 30s, 40s in a wheelchair, historically, that would be trauma first, MS second. So the most common medically uh, acquired reason for disability. MS uh, classically has been known to have greater prevalence in people of Northern European descent, so further from the equator, but uh, in the modern era, we recognize it can absolutely affect everyone of all backgrounds. Um, and uh, there's been really an increased 
uh, impetus in our field to not miss MS, particularly in folks who don't fit that classical profile of white Northern European uh, uh, extraction folks. Um, so we're trying to be much more diligent and vigilant about identifying it and treating it in underrepresented populations in medicine. Now, when we talk about MS, uh, it is almost impossible to just say the words multiple sclerosis without putting it into a clinical phenotype, typically relapsing remitting MS, secondary progressive MS, or the lesser heralded primary progressive MS. Those phenotypes are adapted from a seminal paper from 25 years ago from Fred Lovelin, who is my boss and runs the MS Center here at Mount Sinai. So he really defined the way the disease is construed for the last 25 years. Every clinical trial in MS has been organized around these categories. So all the FDA approvals for our medicines are written in the language of relapsing, remitting, secondary progressive or primary progressive MS. What is meant by these things? They are descriptive terms. So unlike other diseases where the different phenotypes reflect particularly different biology or mechanisms or cell types, this is descriptive of the clinical pattern that someone comes to us with. Now, MS is distinct because it has both relapses, as I described, and progression. And if you think about it, many diseases that are autoimmune or, or inflammatory are relapsing. You can think of many diseases in, in medicine that have a relapsing phenotype. Many neurological diseases are progressive, thinking about Alzheimer's disease or Parkinson's disease or ALS. MS is unique because it's both. It has both relapses and recoveries, but also the potential to be a degenerative progressive disease. The way we depict that in the phenotypes is like this, looking at disability over time. So the y-axis here is just a generic descriptor of disability and time passing typically on the span of many years. If you look at the yellow curves, relapsing, remitting, these are patients who are having relapses of neurologic dysfunction, but they're not worsening in between. They just have relapses. And when they're not having a relapse, they're roughly stable. Secondary progressive MS, the blue curves on the other hand, show that whether or not someone is having a relapse, they are accumulating disability gradually. And here's where you can kind of imagine a neurodegenerative process. Someone is losing function gradually, whether or not they're having these relapse attacks. The least common form of MS, the primary progressive type in pink there, is there to depict that some people who have MS have only the gradual worsening and none of the relapses. And you could imagine it's a little harder to diagnose because relapses are so important in MS. And it also insidiously worsens and it can be the hardest to treat. So here are our phenotypes. I'm gonna show you in a little bit my uh, career contribution, which uh, Dr. Levin mentioned in the intro, which is called the topographical model, which is intended to sort of expand upon this blur the distinctions between these a little bit. I'll show that to you in a little while. First, I'm gonna take this paradigm and go one step deeper. Now, this is sort of the way MS is taught nowadays and the way it's explained. And I think it is incredibly complicated and in some ways still missing things. But what I wanna show you is that the overall clinical picture is these little gray bars. That's akin to what I just showed you, relapses of disability and recovery over time. We try to divide MS up into phases. So there's a subclinical phase before someone ever has symptoms. There's their first event, which we'll talk about, their first relapse, like for instance, optic neuritis. That's what we call initial demyelinating event. Sometimes it's called CIS, clinically isolated syndrome. Then when someone has multiple relapses, we call it relapsing remitting MS. And then if someone begins to progress more gradually, the pink curve rising here, we refer to that as secondary progressive MS. But there are things happening under the surface and the little green arrows are there to represent new MRI lesions. I'm gonna animate this for you in a minute, but the main thing I want you to take away from this picture is what we see in terms of relapses is some events. MRI lesions under the surface happen far more often. So a given patient may have many more lesions than they've ever had relapses. It's something our field has called a clinical MRI paradox for many years. 
I don't think it's that paradoxical, as I'll show you in a second, but it's the reason we get MRI scans relatively frequently for people with MS. We're looking below the surface to see if there are new lesions forming. So here's what I just showed you kind of written out in words. The first event, the first relapse we call clinically isolated syndrome. This is an inflammatory event or phase of the disease. Historically, untreated, back in Charcot's time, over 10 years, roughly 50% of these patients will go on and develop progression and disability and look like that classical description. In the modern era, now, 2022, someone being diagnosed with MS is still going to see that statistic on the internet. 50% chance that they will progress in 10 years. I want to tell all of you that that statistic is outdated, outmoded, it's wrong for people being diagnosed with MS now because we can do so much better. But I think that stat, which is still out there all over the internet and patient education sites and others, um, is very, I think, harmful to people because it tells them that disability is coming. And meanwhile, their neurologists and MS specialists are trying to tell them we can prevent it. And I think that often we can. Let's talk a little bit about clinical picture and workup. Optic neuritis is the most common first attack for MS, and, and it can happen at any point in the course of multiple sclerosis. This is an inflammatory lesion of the optic nerve. It causes vision loss in that eye, typically evolves like other MS relapses over days, lasts for weeks, and then gradually recovers. Typically, patients will complain of pain in the eye, visual blurring and central vision, and loss of color vision because central vision is where color vision lives. So there can be desaturated color, blurred vision, a scotoma, this sort of hazy area in the center of vision. Patients will describe this to me like uh, they have something on the windshield and they can't get it off, or they have a dirty contact lens, or there's a cloud floating in front of their eye. Those descriptions with pain, very suggestive of optic neuritis. Now, optic neuritis alone doesn't give us an MS diagnosis. One relapse alone doesn't. So we've had what's called the McDonald's criteria for the last years. I've grayed out the old versions of it, and I've just shown you what is still the current version, the 2017 version of the McDonald's criteria. And I have this here just to remind me to tell you that you don't have to memorize this criteria, of course, but the principle of diagnosing MS is looking for what's called dissemination in space, so multiple lesions in the central nervous system, and dissemination in time. The fact that this disease is not monophasic, it didn't all happen at one time. Rather, the immune attack that causes these lesions and relapses keeps happening over and over again. So it disseminates in space in the nervous system and it disseminates over time. And I'm gonna show you some MRIs in a second, but we've simplified how we look at this. And kind of what I want you to know is that if the lesions are MS classic, and I'm gonna show you what that means, you only need two of them to determine that the patient has what we consider dissemination in space in the nervous system. And if any new lesions that are MS classic emerge over time, let's say you do a follow-up scan six months later or a year later, any new lesion confirms for us dissemination in time. So I, I kind of refer to this as the any two, any new criteria for lesions. It has made the process of diagnosing MS a lot simpler than it used to be. All right, so I keep talking about classic lesions and what they where they are and what they look like. Let's look at them. Take a moment here and, and let's look at this MRI scan. This is a scan of a patient of mine um, who had a rough time with multiple sclerosis and, and his scan reflects how much damage his brain had accumulated from this disease, um, which can be quite disabling. But let's look at the particulars of these lesions. You're seeing here an axial flare and a sagittal flare. This is a T2-weighted scan. This is not contrast enhanced. This just looks for any lesion that formed at any time. So here's what we call a juxtacortical lesion nestled right under the cortex. So it's right out there at the periphery of the brain touching the gray matter. Here's what we call a periventricular lesion. And the most important thing about a periventricular lesion is that it in fact touches the ventricle. It is not somewhere near the ventricle, but it rather touches the ventricle surface, typically radiates outwards. Here is a posterior fossa lesion in the cerebellar white matter. That's the kind of lesion that would have caused Charcot's findings of nystagmus and intention tremor back in the day. But these are three of the principal locations for MS lesions. 
What else could we say about this scan? The lesions are oval shaped, they're ovoid. They seem to radiate outwards like spokes from a wheel. That gets referred to as Dawson's fingers in the MS literature, kind of pointing upwards. You see that on the sagittal, they're all kind of pointing upwards from the corpus callosum, kind of pointing out at a right angle to the ventricle. Um, you see involvement of the inferior surface of the corpus callosum. So this is very MS classic. And I want you to kind of you know, freeze that in your mind's eye because I'm gonna show you some other examples in a minute that differ from this, but this is the archetype. Here's another example of these posterior fossa lesions, the ones causing intention tremor, that nystagmus, diplopia, slurred speech. And so you see here this MRI scan, you see all of these lesions in the pons and the middle cerebellar peduncle. This is what shows us in life uh, on a routine scan, what in Charcot's time would have to be seen at autopsy and pathology. So you see there a myelin stain of the pons and cerebellum showing those punched out demyelinated lesions. Thankfully, now we can do this very quickly on routine scans um, and act on it. Here are some other ways that MS lesions often look. With, it, with contrast gadolinium, they can often enhance with a ring. Here you see in the middle some other periventricular little ovoid lesions, again, infratentorial in those cerebellar peduncles. There you see some juxtacortical ones, again, nestled right under the cortex. And then finally on the right, a little harder to see, I'll show you another one in a second, but lesions in the spinal cord, which I think are the most important from an MS prognosis perspective. Lesions in the brain, we compensate for. Lesions in the spinal cord typically cause symptoms. I mentioned optic neuritis, so here's what that would look like on an MRI. Um, there I'm circling on a axial view enhancement in the optic nerve, so you can see on that circled optic nerve, there's a fluffy white enhancement on the other optic nerve on the other eye, that looks normal. Um, I like the coronal views for the optic nerve. So here I'm circling the coronal view. So you're facing the patient, that's her left eye. And you see the muscles involved in moving the eye and right in the center of them, poking out from the back of the orbit, you see the optic nerve, which is brightly enhancing there, which you don't see on the other side. I realize it's a dot on a scan. It's much easier when you scroll back and forth through it. But here's what we're looking at when we look for optic neuritis, inflammation just in the optic nerve. Fun fact, um, I said that MS is a central nervous system demyelinating disease. So why would it affect the optic nerve? The optic nerve is not a nerve. It is in fact a piece of brain that is reaching out and grabbing the back of the eye. Um, it's myelinated the way brain is myelinated. So we call it a nerve because it's long, but it's actually an extension of brain itself. I mentioned spinal cord lesions. Here's another good example. On sagittal view, you see this long kind of missile shaped area of oval whiteness in the back of the cord, very classic lesion. And on the axial view sliced through that, you see this chunk missing from the posterior cord. Um, so this, this would be a very concerning lesion to me for uh, MS disease and prognosis. I'll point out it's much easier to see brain lesions than it is to see spinal cord lesions. I think this is a huge problem in our field. And I think it's because enormous resources are being invested in brain imaging and not enough is being invested in spinal cord imaging. I just had a little editorial, a snarky provocative editorial about this um, in uh, JAMA Neurology, where I referred to spinal cord lesions like looking at cave paintings and trying to figure out what we're uh, uh, seeing there, which is the most important part uh, of the central nervous system for MS. So this is, this was nice. I, I learned that if you title things in a creative way, you can get away with a lot of snarky comments and get them into good journals. So that was my, that was my lesson from this past couple of months. Um, I showed you these graphs of MS over time, but really what I think tells the story of how dynamic multiple sclerosis is, is looking at a time lapse of an MRI for somebody with MS. So I, we talk about dissemination in space and time, and it sounds very esoteric. This is what that looks like. If you were to do an MRI scan every month for a patient for two years, it could look like this. This is from 20 years ago before there were treatments. Um, and what you see here is multiple lesions emerging. It's looping. So I wish, I wish we could make lesions go away and start over. We can't do that. But you get a sense of the dynamism of this inflammatory disease, multiple lesions appearing in multiple places. When I first saw this, when I was doing my fellowship, I, I, it looked like a fireworks display. It looked like this just constant explosion of disease activity. It is what we endeavor 
to shut down with our disease-modifying therapies. Now, what else happens in MS? MS is not just a disease of lesions. It's a disease where the entire brain is shrinking. And so there's a great deal of brain volume loss and action atrophy that happens over the course of the disease it speaks to the idea that there's both inflammation relapses and something gradual and progressive happening. So nowadays we can measure this with quantified brain imaging techniques, but in general, I would encourage you when you look at a brain MRI scan, look at the size of the ventricles, and that definitely reveals for you the extent to which the brain has begun to shrink away. And in MS, we think this is a very important outcome measure. Now, I said at the beginning, multiple sclerosis can be difficult to diagnose because uh, it causes neurological symptoms that other diseases can cause. I will not read this slide to you, I promise, but I put it here for reference if you want it, kind of a differential diagnosis of MS. In our diagnostic criteria, it says, well, we have to have no better explanation, which is a fair point, but a little bit of a cop-out, I think, as diagnostic criteria go. Um, we do need to think about other diseases that can cause neurological symptoms, which spans the entire categories of, of medical and, and infectious diseases, for instance. Typically, these can be ruled out by the clinical history and certainly by the imaging. But, you know, we like to keep uh, an open mind and we do a, you know, a bit of a systemic workup every time somebody has these disorders. I have psychogenic at the bottom here, and, and that's because it is an incredibly common MS mimic. Folks that come in who are very depressed, who may have somatic features, who may have non-specific tingling and numbness and a sense of cognitive fog, um, often end up getting a workup for MS or they're told that they might have MS. And again, that's why I mentioned at the beginning, non-specific symptoms are not enough. There's actually a lot of work in this area because we've tried to diagnose MS as early as possible because it's become such a treatable disease, but there's a tension there between trying to diagnose the disease early and getting it wrong. This is work done by Andy Solomon, uh, who was a Mount Sinai medical student back when I was a neurology resident here, and now he is a prominent and very successful MS specialist in his own right. He runs the MS Center in Vermont. Um, but he's done a lot of work on misdiagnosis in MS, getting it wrong. And so that informed everything I've said up till this point to try to you know, set it up. How, how can we do better? Here was a paper that they did a couple of years ago now, looking at 110 people who'd been misdiagnosed with MS. Why? So Atypical symptoms were the main you know, reason. They lacked objective evidence of a central nervous system uh, uh, deficit or lesion. They, people over relied on an, on an MRI report without bringing real specificity to how they look at those lesions. Uh, so people get misdiagnosed with this disease. Um, what were the alternative diagnoses? Well, these patients had migraine or fibromyalgia. We could debate what fibromyalgia actually is, but not a central nervous system focal disease. Um, they may have nonspecific, non-localizing symptoms, conversion disorder or psychogenic, or sometimes other inflammatory diseases like NMO, which I'm not gonna get into here. But you see the point here that one has to bring real specificity and thinking in terms of area of the brain and spinal cord affected to the diagnosis. Here's an example of how one can get this wrong. So this is an MRI scan for a patient who had nonspecific complaints, um, and some tingling and some other quasi-neurological things. And here's this person's scan. Um, what are some red flags here? that This is not MS. So these are peripherally situated little dots kind of hanging out in the peripheral white matter, not periventricular. They're not oval shaped like the ones I showed you. They're sort of round dots. They are not kind of sporadic, but rather sort of symmetrically distributed. Um, I know you have to take my word for it because you can't see the whole scan here, but there were none in the posterior fossa, that is none in the brainstem or cerebellum, none of them enhanced with contrast. So this is very common finding of something which is not MS, but rather what migraine can look like on a brain MRI scan. Migraine is associated with these nonspecific little dots, not in typical MS locations. Here's another one. This is a patient that was sent to me for not only MS, but worsening MS. Um, let's look at this. Obviously, this is an abnormal MRI scan, many patchy lesions, but again, they're really not periventricular. They're not oval shaped and radiating outwards. They become confluent, but almost in a line, uh, particularly in that left hemisphere. What line is that? Well, that line is end arteriovascular territory. 
This is watershed territory. This is hypertensive white matter disease, vascular disease, not MS lesions. So yes, this person was developing new lesions, but it wasn't because she had MS and it was worsening. It's because her vascular risk factors and blood pressure were incompletely controlled and she was continuing to have watershed areas of damage. So I thought this was another good example. So I get halfway through the talk before I mention cells, which is sort of my, my way. But uh, so the reason why um, we care about these localization of lesions, the reason why that is such the hallmark of multiple sclerosis is because they are in a particular distribution, which we call perivenular. They are around the veins draining blood from the brain. And that has to do with the very specific immunology of MS. So there's that scan I showed you before. That's where the veins are. That's where the lesions are. And here's a quick graphic. The only immunology I'll show you in this talk. Here's a quick graphic to animate how we think MS fundamentally occurs. There are CD4 positive T cells that are activated against some sort of antigen to myelin in the periphery, in the bloodstream, in the lymph nodes. I will say I just betrayed my neurology perspective there. Neurologists refer to the entire body as the periphery. Um, <laughs> things that are in the brain are central and everything else we consider peripheral. It's a little bit of our, our you know, vantage point, I guess. But first, these T cells become activated in the peripheral bloodstream and in the lymph nodes. There's a proliferation of these self-reactive Th1 cells that have now been um, uh, activated against myelin antigen, they are able to gain access across the blood-brain barrier, which is compromised through alpha-4 integrin binding. Once in the central nervous system, these cells are reactivated typically by a resident antigen-presenting cell and microglia in the central nervous system, and now reactivated against myelin in a setting of lots of myelinated cells, they cause demyelination. That's the simplified view to be sure, but it speaks to localization, why lesions are in the places that they are in MS, and it's because that's where the permeable bloodstream is, these perivenular areas. One way that we look for the inflammatory response in the central nervous system is through a spinal tap, through looking for oligoclonal bands. This is a classic test for MS, we still do it part of our diagnostic criteria. We look for these unique bands of IgG in the central nervous system that are not in the periphery. The problem is we still don't know what those bands are targeted against, and we may never know, but there was a rather prominent paper that came out very recently about Epstein-Barr virus as a trigger for multiple sclerosis, which is here, which suggests that EBV is an essential part of what makes the immune system self-reactive. Um, I will say, uh, here's something that I think every academic doctor can have in common, which is uh, jealousy of uh, someone else's altmetric scores. So this paper came out less than a month ago. Um, it's, been, it's been pretty widely picked up by the media. So we spend half of our time now answering patient questions about whether EBV caused their multiple sclerosis. The short answer is uh, maybe, but since 95% of adults also have Epstein-Barr virus, it's not really an actionable finding. And to be honest, we've known it for 20 years. This was just a very successful and compelling paper making the case that just came out uh, this month. Um, so here's that picture I showed you before, which now hopefully you're kind of seeing the clinical picture, the lesions forming, that evolution over time. But let's look at it a different way. So this is my life's work. Um, my wife doesn't like it when I call it my life's work. She thinks it's a little bit fatalistic, but. Uh, but it's my contribution to the field, let's put it that way. Um, it's every good idea I've ever had put into one thing. So when I showed you that graph um, and I showed you the relapse phenotypes, you know, it doesn't really tell a story of an individual patient and where their lesions are and what kind of symptoms they cause. So what I've tried to do in explaining MS disease course is put this idea of lesion localization back into the mix, what I call disease topography. It's the idea that there are lesions in the spinal cord and optic nerve, as you've seen, lesions in the brain, stem, and cerebellum, as you've seen, and then there's all those periventricular lesions. But here's the thing. The periventricular lesions, those brain lesions, are often very, very well compensated, whereas the lesions in the brain, stem, and cerebellum cause symptoms, and the lesions in the spinal cord and the optic nerve cause a lot of symptoms. The way I conceptualize this is the central nervous system as a 
tank of reserve. How much reserve is there in those different regions? In the shallow end of this pool, the spinal cord and the optic nerve, not a lot of reserve. Lesions there cause demonstrable findings. In the deep end of this pool, the hemispheres of the brain, enormous amounts of reserve, compensatory ability, plasticity, and lesions there are often clinically silent, hiding beneath the threshold. So if you'll indulge me for one and a half minutes, I'm gonna show you the way I think MS clinical course really behaves in a more sort of clinically meaningful way. So here's this depiction. You've got the central nervous system. First, lesions might appear. And if those lesions are in the brain, we might never know it because they don't cross the clinical threshold. All we're seeing is what's above that threshold of reserve. It's only lesions in the spinal cord, like that one, that crossed the threshold, caused a relapse. Now we know about this patient. They've had a, my a myelopathic or a spinal cord event. And then as time passes, there is dissemination in space and time. New lesions form. Some of them in areas like the brainstem that cause relapses, other ones in the deep end of this pool of reserve in the brain, not causing relapses, but happening under the surface. This is relapsing remitting multiple sclerosis. But if you notice what's happening more subtly over the course of this depiction, the water level is draining the amount of reserve that someone has is declining. And I showed you that atrophy happens in MS, brain atrophy. You can think of the loss of reserve, the draining of that pool as that brain atrophy, the loss of compensation. And it unmasks above the clinical threshold, all the signs and symptoms of those brainstem lesions, cerebellar lesions, spinal cord lesions. So that 20 years into the disease, now, we've got a situation that might look like what Charcot described, scanning speech, nystagmus, imbalance, maybe some spinal cord symptoms, and that's progressive MS. So I told you about the phenotypes, and now I've shown you this depiction, which blurs the distinction between all of them, but it shows us what, in essence, the enemy looks like. The enemy is lesions, and the enemy is loss of brain volume and loss of reserve, and all of our efforts in MS are dedicated to addressing those things. So what do we do? How do we treat MS? First of all, we treat relapses with steroids. Secondly, we now have over 20 FDA approved treatments for disease modification, preventing relapses, preventing lesions, preventing disability, changing the course of the disease, um, over 20. And we treat the symptoms. So we work here in a comprehensive care center where symptoms of MS like fatigue and others become a very important part of quality of life. So I'm gonna spend a few minutes just sort of depicting for you kind of how neurologists currently think, not because you're gonna make these distinctions, decisions necessarily yourself, but I want you to really get a sense of what goes into it. First of all, someone who has an acute relapse, as we said earlier, lasts for a day or days. You really have to distinguish this from what's called UTOF's phenomenon, which is another 19th century neurologist name, but basically the idea of overheating. Someone overheating with MS from fever or infection develops a recrudescence of a lot of old symptoms. That is not a relapse. A relapse is a true new lesion, a true new event. And that's what we treat with these enormous doses of steroids, a thousand milligrams of methylprednisolone, sometimes 1,250 milligrams of steroid of prednisone for three to five days. Low dose prednisone, and by low dose in our world, we mean 60 milligrams, um, the sort of prednisone pack is not used. If you're gonna treat an MS relapse, it really needs to be with these enormous doses for short periods of time with all of the side effect management that you're all familiar with. I did point out you wanna distinguish a relapse from this overheating phenomenon using the language of the topographical model. When someone overheats, all of their reserve suddenly drains. The tank empties and it unmasks all their underlying deficits. But that is not the same as a true new relapse. So what you're really looking for with someone with MS is do they have new symptoms that they haven't had before? Someone having a recrudescence, a reemergence of all the old symptoms we really worry more about urinary tract infection, COVID, fever of unknown origin, dehydration, things that transiently affect neural function and transiently drain reserve. You really don't want to give a thousand milligrams of methylprednisolone to someone who has a UTI, or at least I try not to, but it happens. 
And we really try to teach our emergency department colleagues how to make that distinction. All right, I've got a couple of slides here on treatment and then I'll stop. Um, and again, not because I want you to know all the medicines in MS, but because I just want you to see where we're at as a field in terms of how we use our current strategy. So all of our disease modifying therapies are immune modulators. They work in different ways, um, but we have, as I said, roughly 20 of them. And again, this is just sort of a summary for you to see how we think these days. Some are pills, some are self-injection, some are infusions. There's a broad range of frequency and there's a huge range of safety and efficacy of these drugs. Some of them have been around since the early 90s and some of them have just been approved in the past year. So there's a huge acceleration of therapeutic options in multiple sclerosis. We like to think of our field as the trendsetter for neurology becoming a disease treating uh, uh, specialty as opposed to just a diagnostic specialty. So I'm just gonna talk you through two of these, two or three of these slides and then I'll stop. Um, sometimes we see an MS patient that really worries us. She has innumerable lesions, brainstem lesions, spinal cord lesions. She's developed weakness, cognitive deficits, and we want the most efficacious medicine we can to try to shut that disease process down. What the neurologist is then doing is reshuffling this deck of options, prioritizing the most effective medicines that we have, and then choosing amongst them on the basis of risks and side effects and comorbidities. So that's one example. Sometimes, however, we see patients who have incredibly mild disease. They have maybe one or two lesions. They had a mild optic neuritis that recovered fully. They are neurologically 100% normal, high functioning, low lesion burden. And we can prioritize a safer medicine, one that might not be as effective. Similarly, we might do this for a patient that has MS, but also many comorbidities. Because if someone has cardiac disease and pulmonary disease and other autoimmune conditions, we might want to prioritize the safest of our medicines. And then basically, we're shuffling our options in a totally different order. What you can kind of get a sense of here is we have soft biomarkers for how we choose these medicines. What we don't yet have are genetic uh, uh, you know, predictors of disease response. We don't have molecular assays to know who's going to respond to which medicine. We're not there yet. And so there are no protocols, which can be quite frustrating for many people in our field, um, since there's still a lot of style that goes into it. We all have patients that we worry that they're not gonna be able to take a medicine all the time um, for a chronic disease. And so we can sometimes prioritize ones that are given infrequently. We have medicines given in yearly cycles or infused monoclonal antibodies that are given in yearly cycles or every six month cycles like our B cell depleters. So sometimes, dose frequency becomes important. Sometimes patients really only want a pill. So that makes our lives a little bit easier as it knocks off three quarters of our choices and we can choose amongst pills. But in any case, when you see a patient with MS on a disease modifying therapy, they were typically chosen for a reason, but we have a lot of options and we are trying to customize those reasons as best we can without predictive biomarkers, hard biomarkers that really yet allow us to personalize these decisions. That's where our field is at. And you can kind of think of it as, you know, somewhat analogous to what happens in rheumatology, but perhaps a little bit different. We don't use combination strategies. Not very analogous to what's happening in oncology, where I feel like the molecular diagnostics and genetics have revolutionized how treatments are designed and chosen. We're not there yet in MS, but I think that's our future. One of the issues is that MS is a lifelong disease and we have medicines dosed twice a day, 700 times a year that wash out in hours. And we have medicines that we can give every few months. And nowadays, medicines like B cell depleters that last for years. So the pharmacokinetics of this are complicated. I first presented and made this slide for a national conference in February, 2020. And I said at the time, or actually January, 2020, I said, you know, who knows what the consequences of long-term immune suppression might be for people with MS. And then two months later, we had COVID. And now we've spent the last two years talking to all of our patients with MS on these powerful, long-acting immune modulators and B-cell depleters about how to navigate a viral pandemic. So that's been a huge challenge in our field, as I'm sure it has been for many of you in, in your fields as well. Um, in the interest of time, I, I had a little section here on symptom management. I'm going to skip it um, just because I want to get to the very end. But, you know, if, the, if you're really interested in symptom management, I could show you some other slides. But I wanted to end with 
a timely update and then give you time for questions. So MS and COVID, uh, I'm sure all of you in all of your fields have been fielding questions about this in addition to, of course, taking care of people with COVID. Um, this is a piece of work that came out in mid 2020. So this is early COVID era research, but it turned out to be absolutely prescient in our field. This was the Italian cohort and also a early registry in the US called COVIMS, um, which was put together very quickly as COVID first spread in the first wave here. But although there have been a, dozens of papers since then, they all say the same thing. So I thought I'd show you the original, which is that people with MS were not intrinsically more vulnerable to severe COVID. Having this autoimmune disease didn't make them more vulnerable to bad COVID outcomes unless they had progressive MS. So secondary progressive and primary progressive MS, that is to say patients who'd accumulated more disability, often institutionalized or in nursing homes or um, you know, with mobility issues, they had higher risk of hospitalization and death. And that was basically borne out across our entire global health system people with more advanced comorbidities and, and who were more physically and neurologically disabled um, had much worse COVID outcomes. So even though this is very early data, it remained true all the way through the pandemic. So too did this. This is also relatively early in the pandemic course. We wanted to understand what do our medicines, these range of immune modulators do to COVID risk? And the punchline was only the top one there only ocrelizumab, which is a B-cell depleter, it's humanized rituximab. So in our field, we have rituximab, ocrelizumab, and ofatumumab, all of which are B-cell depleting monoclonal antibodies. Um, only the B-cell depleters seem to increase COVID morbidity and mortality. Not a great deal. Their odds ratio was um, uh, 1.8. Uh, a year and a half later, the Biggest data was the odds ratio of about 1.9. So this was really right on point, although early in the pandemic. So we didn't stop our immune modulators during COVID, but we really tried to emphasize all of the safety uh, uh, techniques that we have all adopted and encouraged our patients to adopt, particularly vaccinations. So that's the last point. So rather than trying to summarize an enormous amount of information on vaccines, I thought I would show you a very good resource that you could direct any MS patients that you have too, which is the National MS Society's um, MS COVID informational website. I work on a committee that helps to advise this. And the punchline is um, the mRNA vaccines did not increase COVID risk. I'm sorry, <laughs> I misspoke. The mRNA vaccines did not increase MS risk. Um, they were as protective for people with MS against COVID as the general population. Our medicines probably didn't decrease, decrease their efficacy very much. Although again, the B cell depleters block the ability to mount an antibody response after vaccination, but a lot of work in our field and others have shown that T-cell immunity post-vaccination seems to be robust. So we are encouraging all of our patients with MS on all of the disease-modifying therapies to get vaccinated and boosted. Um, and this website outlines a lot of that in patient-friendly language uh, if you would like to send patients to it. So I know I skipped the symptom management part, but uh, again, I think that's sort of the most run-of-the-mill of uh, the aspects of MS care and, and stuff that you're all very familiar with already in, in medical practice. So I'll, I'll hold off on that unless anyone has burning questions about it. But otherwise, with uh, about 10 minutes to spare, I will stop, acknowledge uh, our MS center at Mount Sinai. So the two guys in the middle there uh, on the left is Aaron Miller, who's our vice chair for education. And on the right is Fred Lublin, who I mentioned created the phenotypes and runs our center. Um, and we are a comprehensive care center. So this group includes uh, clinical research coordinators, social workers. Um, we now have neurocognitive specialists and cognitive fellows. We have our own fellowship program within multiple sclerosis, nurse practitioners, uh, medical assistants. Um, so it, it, we endeavor to provide both very cutting edge care, but also really comprehensive chronic disease home type care for people with this disease. And I would end by saying, I think because of this type of work, um, the outlook for people being diagnosed with MS now is so vastly different than it was 20 years ago. Um, I try to give my new patients a pretty optimistic take on how fast our field is moving. I tell them, if we do things right, our field is going to move faster than your disease. And I think that's a powerful concept.
the idea that we could try to freeze the disease at a point in time while we get better and better at treating it. So I will stop there. Thank you guys so much for the invitation. I hope that some of this had some resonance or relevance for many of you, and I'm very, very happy to take your questions. Thank you, Dr. Krieger. That was a wonderful overview of MS. Thank you. We do, uh, Stephen, have some questions in the chat, <clears throat> which I can help manage with you. Wonderful. The first, the first one is, uh, is there any way to stimulate remyelination of affected, of affected, or of affected mm -hmm. neurons? Great question. Thank you. So um, I could spend an hour talking about that, but I will be brief about it. So um, there's an enormous amount of research on remyelination therapies, a extraordinary investment from both the National MS Society, the NIH, and industry, because it is in some ways the holy grail of uh, MS treatment. And virtually all of the attempts to date have been unsuccessful. Um, so it's been actually quite frustrating. Part of the problem there is you can design a beautiful monoclonal antibody like opicinumab that stimulates uh, oligodendrocyte precursor cells to make new myelin. And it works beautifully. And then you give it to patients and it fails because monoclonal antibodies are too large to get across the blood-brain barrier in sufficient numbers. So you can give the remyelinating agent to the patient, but it doesn't access the central nervous system where it needs to go. So that's been one of the problems with remyelination strategies with stem cell strategies for the similar reasons. Um, so it's a hot area of research. The idea is to be able to do it without having to do spinal taps and intrathecal infusions, but that is often how these things are attempted to get around the blood-brain barrier, but that's not a good long-term strategy. So there is an enormous amount of work in that area. Um, the best we have so far are phase one, early phase two studies because all of the later ones to date have not been successful. There's a question of whether you ever combine therapies. Great. So, yeah, I mentioned in contradistinction to our colleagues in rheumatology and, and immunology, we don't um, actually. Ours is a monotherapy based approach. And that is largely because of the risks of combination immune suppression that were seen in earlier MS trials from 15 or so years ago. Um, there have been several big combination studies. One of them, again, run by our division director, Fred Loveland, the largest NIH project ever in MS, combined two of our old school medicines. This was done uh, 15 years ago now. Um, and the combination of the two proved not to be better than either one by themselves. So it was a negative study, but we learned an enormous amount from it. Another combination trial done a few years later looked at two different immune modulators for MS, and that seemed to cause PML. Um, PML that happens, of course, in HIV and, and, uh, and hematologic malignancies, because if you really keep the immune system out of the brain, it can't do surveillance for things like the JC virus and PML uh, remains an issue. So those were very humbling in our field. And part of the reason why companies in the NIH and others have been rather reluctant to do other combination trials, but I do think that there's a future there, particularly as we get remyelination therapies neural repair therapies, then I think combination will be in order. Shut down the immune process and layer it with a repair strategy. Uh, if I'm invited back in 10 years, I hopefully I'll be able to tell you more about that. We won't, we won't wait 17, Stephen. How's that? <laughs> I mean, it might take our field that long to get to what I just described. But we'll see. So there's a question. Could you comment on whether you see much MS as a result of cancer immune checkpoint inhibitors and how it presents? Uh, that's a great question. So I, it, I am not an expert in that, but I do think the checkpoint inhibitors obviously can unmask an inflammatory demyelinating process. Um, whether that is quite akin to multiple sclerosis is sort of an area of debate. It, it doesn't behave ultimately just like MS for the most part. Um, more avid inflammatory and demyelinating response and, and potentially more monophasic. Um, it may not sort of kick off this cascade that causes a chronic relapsing inflammatory progressive disease, but I think it's a little bit early to know that. Um, but yeah, absolutely tells us kind of like the TNF alpha inhibitors, which can also unmask inflammatory demyelinating disease. Now we do have to be very cognizant of how tweaking the immune system in one capacity may trigger or unmask autoimmunity in another, particularly in the central nervous system compartment. Mm, for sure. 
Um, there's a question, is there an explanation for primary progressive disease? So, yeah, I mean, so, well, without getting too much into the weeds of my own thinking, um, there's a lot of debate in our field as to whether primary progressive MS is really distinct from the others, or if it is all part of the same pathophysiology. I will say this, you can't tell them apart on MRI. What I showed you, those lesions in those locations, that can be true for any phenotype of MS. And the loss of brain volume can happen irrespective of phenotype of MS. So my thinking is that primary progressive MS is no different from the relapsing forms and the secondary progressive forms. It's just a question of where the lesions are and whether the brain and spinal cord had enough reserve to compensate for them. So in my topographical model, if you're interested in that, you can look at it. I model all the different phenotypes of MS using the same principles in that same tank. And so I don't think the clinical phenotype or the clinical phenomena is genuinely different. I think the same drivers of inflammation and neurodegeneration are at play. I just think it comes together in a way that takes a more progressive form in some patients with the disease. So it leads into the next question. And you got a shout out from uh, Dr. Moll, a great talk. And then the question is, uh, do some therapies have better efficacy for lesions in specific areas of the brain? So we don't think that, it's a great question. We don't think that our medicines necessarily target specific brain areas or, or protect them differentially because they are all working on the immune system to sort of stop the influx, which causes all the lesions. But what I would say is a patient who has already accumulated spinal cord and brainstem lesions, seems statistically more likely to have more spinal cord and brainstem lesions. And those are the most deleterious. So although our medicines aren't necessarily targeted at specific areas, when someone has topographically concerning lesions, spinal cord and brainstem, we as a field are much more apt to use our higher efficacy medicines because that feeling of urgency to shut this down before it causes more disability is more present in those situations. I think that also, uh, we have one more question, which is a good one too, because it's, um, do you have any advice for non-neurologists seeing patients who are in that early phase of MS where it's still unclear whether they will present with a second inflammatory episode? Yeah, that's a great question. So, um, you know, what I tried to show with the McDonald's criteria at the beginning, not that one has to memorize it, but is that it doesn't take much to actually confirm an MS diagnosis nowadays. That is to say, if someone has had one definitive event, and two lesions that are in the right places, we can probably tell that person that she has multiple sclerosis and treat her because her risk of having subsequent attacks is so high as to make it essentially diagnosable with multiple sclerosis very, very early. So I would say if you have a patient that has had a definitive event and has an MRI scan that looks like MS, um, that person very well may warrant treatment for the disease. That's the kind of patient that we see all the time here at the MS Center to to pose that question. Um, So part of why I showed the picture of all of us is, you know, there's nine of us here and and a couple of nurse practitioners. It's a big group. And uh, we we would like to try to be helpful for patients like that um, as much as as we can, not necessarily to take over their care, but just to provide that point of guidance. So if you have people like that, that are unsure, their neurologist has been unsure, um, we're happy to see them. Great. Well, that brings us right to 9.30, Stephen. I think that by all the questions, I think it's obvious that the department enjoyed your talk today on MS. I thought that it was uh, an excellent overview. So thank you very much and uh, have a nice day, everybody. Enjoy. Thank you, Dr. Thomas. Take it easy, everyone.